Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm, in, in every way, a very warm welcome to you all tonight. Um, it's good to come together and worship God as his people. Um, just a few things uh, by way of notices as we begin. Um, first of all, uh, straight after this evening's service, there will be the meeting for those who go to secondary school age, uh, to secondary school. Um, so do please go out during the last hymn for that. It's at Margaret's house tonight, I believe. Good, there's a, a nod of recognition there. It wasn't a surprise, that's good. Um, it's at Margaret's house tonight with Simon leading. So um, if you want to know any more about that, do, do catch Simon uh, during that last hymn. Um, just also to, to say as well, um, we have community groups this week, so details of the venues for that are on the inside of the notice sheet. If you go to the Bitten and Wollstone group, there are some notes for the meeting out uh, in the foyer, so do grab those if you would like those for that meeting on Wednesday. Also, just really to highlight for next week um, that we have a baptismal service at 4 p.m. here which we're very excited about, and do be in prayer for Rachel as uh, that day comes closer. Um, but because of that service, there then won't be another evening service here at half six next week. So um, if you do come at half six next week, you'll probably find us just packing up and, and going home. So uh, please come at four o'clock next week rather than, than half past six. Today, as, uh, as you'll know, if you were here this morning, uh, our Pastor Paul is preaching in Sen at Send Evangelical, and we're delighted to welcome Pete and Sophie and the family. I've, I've seen them somewhere this evening. <laughs> Super. Um, it's good to have them all here with us, and it was great to, uh, to hear Pete's preaching this morning. We listened to it as we were traveling in the car, but it was great to, to feel the blessing of that this morning, and Pete is preaching for us again tonight a little bit later on. So, let's come as we worship and commit our time to God in prayer before we sing together. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we thank you that we can come and worship you together tonight. Lord, we pray that we would just be struck once again with the majesty of the God that you are. That we would be overawed, Lord, at your greatness your majesty, your might, and, and your mercy. So, Lord, help us as we read your word, as we pray to you, as we sing praise to you. Lord, may all of these things lift us closer to you. By your spirit, Lord, meet with us. Challenge us, Lord, and convict us as we worship you tonight. Because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the things that uh, we aim to do as Christians as we worship together is to affirm the truths that we believe in. And our first song really does that. It reminds us of these great doctrinal truths about God, who he is, Father, Son, and Spirit. So we'll stand and sing together, we believe in God Almighty, who made the heavens and earth. Let's stand and sing together.
Do please be seated. We're going to turn and read from God's Word together, and our reading tonight is from the book of Acts, and chapter 12, Acts chapter 12. If you have a church Bible, that's on page 920. And tonight Pete's going to be talking to us about uh, and giving us thoughts about God's sovereignty. So maybe you'd like to have that in mind as we read through this amazing account in Acts 12. This is what we read. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, And when he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and the light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly, and the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak round you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and has rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people, and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning with them, with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell all these things to James and to the brothers. And he departed and went to another place. And when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. After Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, where they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Well, we thank God for his word. 
Our God is indeed sovereign and in control of all things. Our next hymn really speaks of the great God that we have. It's, it's a new hymn. Um, it's one particularly that Rachel wanted us to sing uh, at her baptism next week. So uh, it gives us a chance to, to learn it tonight. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Dan and, and the team. And you're going to do a verse and the chorus for us. And after they've done that, we'll stand and sing together. But it's a, a wonderful song that speaks of God's great power that he is in control, that he's indescribable and uncontainable, and that we humbly fall to our knees and proclaim that he is an amazing God. So thank you, Dan. Stand and sink.
Our God is truly amazing, and it's to this God that we're going to come in in prayer in a moment. We're going to pray for some of our needs here as a church. I've been chatting to, to Pete before the service as well, and uh, we're going to pray for some of the needs at uh, Send Evangelical, where Pete's from. They uh, had great rejoicing last Sunday with three baptisms, so we're, we're going to pray for those who were baptized there and uh, for their ongoing walk with the Lord. You also had a, a goodbye to one of your workers as well, didn't you? So uh, we'll really remember the church at Send there as well. Um, I'm aware that uh, we're kind of at the end of June as well and, and on into July, so there are new prayer diaries. If you, if you normally take those, they're at the front here. I think there's some at the back. So if you'd like some help in what to pray for and who to pray for in the coming month, then do please take, take one of those uh, to help you. If there's things that you, you'd like us to pray for, that you'd like people to know about, that we can pray for for you, then there's a, a box here at the front as well that you can just put a little slip in and we can come and bring our needs, our cares, our concerns to our great, amazing God. So let's come to him now and, and pray to him. Oh Lord our God, we thank you that you are amazing and indescribable and, and uncontainable. That, Lord, you are beyond what we can even imagine. And Lord, we need to ask for your forgiveness for those times when we try and bring you down to, to our size. When we try and make you like us. And imagine that you are limited like us, that you have the same flaws and and uh, desires as us, but Lord, you are so far removed from us. You are perfect and holy and mighty and, and righteous that no one can look on you, that even the angels in heaven have to shield their eyes because of your glory. And yet, Lord, your word tells us, and so we believe it, that you are the God who has created us. That you are the God who has seen the depths of our hearts. Who has seen our hearts in all their sinfulness, in all their depravity. And yet still loves us. You're the God who loves us so much that you have sent your own son to die for us, to be punished, to suffer and to die for our sins so that we can be washed clean, so that we can stand here and, and cry out, Abba, Father, so that we can come and, yes, humbly kneel before you, but come with confidence because of what Jesus has done for us. Oh God, you are truly amazing. And as we consider, Lord, the God that you are tonight, just excite us and thrill us as we, we look into your word. As we consider that it's not kings or, or parliaments or rulers that are in control, but you. Lord, help us to, to know that in such a confusing world. When there are so many different voices, so many different people that are just vying to be in control. With leaders that come and go. Lord, you are in control. You know the end from the beginning. You are redeeming your church. And help us, Lord, to stand firm and to trust you in difficult times. We thank you, Lord, for what we can see you doing in your church. We thank you, Lord, for everyone who's gathered here tonight. Lord, speak to each one. For, for whatever reason we may be here tonight, whether we, we've come willingly or, or out of duty or, or maybe because we've been told to. Lord, speak to each one. Because it's only by your power that you can reveal yourself to us. It's only by your power that you can speak and, and convict and convince of sin and, and of a need for a savior. So Lord, speak to each one tonight. 
We thank you, Lord, for Rachel's baptism coming up next week. And we pray, Lord, that you just particularly be close to her this week. Lord, protect her. May she know your nearness as uh, her baptism day comes closer. And Lord, may that be a day of rejoicing when we consider what you have done in her life. We thank you, Lord, for the baptisms that uh, were held at Send Evangelical last week. Lord, we pray for those three that, particularly now, that you would protect them, that you would strengthen them in their faith, that they would come to realize what a great God you are, that you not only save, but you keep, and that you sanctify, and that, Lord, you promise to make us more like yourself each day. So, Lord, may they come to know you for the faithful God that you are, a God who begins a work and a God who completes a work in people's lives. So Lord, just bless them in these coming weeks and months. We pray, Lord, particularly for Pete and Sophie and their ministry there in the church. Lord, help them as they they labor each week for you. May they be encouraged by your goodness. May they be encouraged by your faithfulness. May they be able to say at the end of each week that it's not in their strength, that they've been able to achieve anything, but only because of your goodness, only because of your enabling, only because of your working. Lord, forgive us each for when we think we can achieve things by ourselves. Lord, help us to rest in you. Help us to realize that all our strength, everything, Lord, comes from you. So, Lord, be with us now. Bless the rest of our time together. Help Pete as he he comes up shortly and just brings your word to us. Lord, may you feel at home amongst us. May he, Lord, by your spirit, bring that word that we need to hear. That you would be glorified in this meeting of your church tonight. Because we pray this and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So before Pete comes up and speaks to us, we're going to sing once more. As I said, we're thinking of God's sovereignty tonight, and uh, this is the hymn that immediately came to mind as uh, I was uh, preparing for for tonight. A sovereign protector I have. I did say to Dan, please, can we not have that that minor Welsh tune? But we've got it anyway. And he said he's going to end on a major chord for us. But it's great words as we stand and sing and remind ourselves yet again of what a great God we have. Let's stand and sing.
Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you for your prayers, Trevor. We, um, we, did, we had three baptisms last Sunday. One of the people being baptized was, uh, was a man who, as he put it, has just, been, just finished a government-sponsored holiday in prison. He spent uh, two and a half years there. He came out. He, he, he was saved just before he went in. He, he spent two and a half in the, years in there. He came out. He's just been baptized. And as soon as he came out, we, we got to Acts chapter 12. And in Acts chapter 12, we, we have a prison break. And I thought he really enjoyed that passage. And then Acts chapter 16, again, prison break. Um, and it's only just now I've realized I've chosen two prison breaks to preach on today. Um, and so he, I think, really appreciated those passages. But perhaps you're, you're, you're thinking, well, what's this got to do with me? Because I don't anticipate being in prison anytime soon. You, you never know, but we, we don't anticipate it. Um, I don't anticipate needing to be broken out by an angel because I'm going to be executed in the morning. So what does this passage have to do with me? Well, as Trevor said a little bit already, I think the big theme of this passage is that God is in charge. God, God's in control. And very relevantly here, God's in charge and God's in control when people try to, to stop the gospel from advancing and they want to, to flatten the church and they, they can't do it. And so very relevantly for us, we, we can know that the gospel will keep going forward. God's in charge. But even more so than that, it's, 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 it's wider than just the gospel going forward. I think it can give us confidence that God's in charge in every area of life, every area we see in the world. So when we look at politics and everything's just chaotic and you see no way forward that doesn't result in more chaos, it's, it's hard to know, well, who's in charge? But this passage will remind us, well, God's in charge. And perhaps if you're suffering at the moment, when if you're going through something particularly difficult, we can again ask, well, who's really in charge here? If God's in charge, he wouldn't let this happen. So perhaps he's not in charge. But this passage reminds us that in suffering, whether in death, like for James, or in life, like for Peter, God's in control. And so as we, as we look at the passage together this evening, we're going to see four consequences to the fact that God is in charge. We're, we're going to say God is in charge and therefore these four things are true. So number one, God is in charge so Herod can plot. God is in charge so Herod can plot. He, he can plot all he likes but he's not going to get very far. So in, in verse one, King Herod is introduced. That's a name that comes up a lot in the New Testament uh, because the Herod family, it's a bit of a, a dynasty in, in New Testament times. There's loads of them and they were in charge of different areas of Israel for the better part of 50 years. So just to get our heads around it a little bit, the, the Herod family tree has got Herod the Great at the top. He, he's the grandfather figure. He's the one who ordered the slaughter of the baby boys born in Bethlehem. But then in the next generation down, you've got another couple of Herods. One of them is called Herod Antipas. He was Herod the Great's third son. He's the one who had John the Baptist killed. He's the one who, who conducted one of the trials of Jesus, mocking him and, and laughing at him. But the, the generation after that is today's Herod. It's Herod the Great's grandson, but not through the Herods who had John the Baptist killed. They've, they've got a very complicated family tree. Um, Herod the Great's granddaughter, Herodias, she was in a, in a relationship with two of her uncles at different times. And so even drawing the family tree can get complex. And that tells you a little bit about what the family's like. But it's important because it's telling us that, that when this Herod, that the grandson of Herod the Great, when this Herod arrests James and Peter, he's part of a, a bigger picture. Every Herod in the family has opposed Jesus in one way or another. So this isn't just about one individual man's personal opposition to the gospel. He's here, he, he's representing all rulers who have tried to stand against the gospel in, in different ages or different eras. So verse one, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. 
Then verse 2, we hear Herod has killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. He, he has him executed. And so this is the first of the apostles to die. Um, this was prophesied, in fact, by Jesus in Mark 10. And unlike Judas, who died, I don't count him as an apostle he who died because he'd already kind of relinquished that role. But uh, James is the first real apostle to die, and he's not replaced as an apostle because he is still one of the apostles. He's, he's now more alive than he's ever been. He's in the, the presence of Jesus. He is one of the 12 for all time. But that, that's James dispatched. Verse 3 then, when, when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. That's Passover time. That's the, the same time of year that Jesus had been arrested. And just as Jesus was delivered over to Herod at Passover time and then brought out to be killed in order to satisfy a, a baying crowd, that's also Herod's plan for Peter. Verse 4, when he'd seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So, so how's Peter being guarded? Well, there's four squads of soldiers, we're told there in verse 4. That's four groups of four who took their turn on shifts. So at any one time, you've got two soldiers chained to Peter and two guarding outside the door. We, we see that in a couple of verses' time. And, and you might think, well, isn't that overkill for one fisherman turned preacher? But perhaps Herod has heard what happened last time. Peter was in prison. Acts chapter 5, verse 19. During the night, an, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and, and brought them out. So Herod isn't taking any chances. So what happens next? Well, the, the guards keeping Peter in prison are about as effective as the soldiers guarding Jesus' tomb on Resurrection Sunday. Peter escapes. But we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. We're still thinking about Herod. So Let's skip all, of, all the, the escape and the prayer meeting so on. Pick it up in verse 18 so we can keep going with Herod. When day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. So that, that's normal practice in the era. The, the job of a prison guard is to guard the prisoners, and if they escape, the prison guard gets the sentence they would have received. But, but taking a step back, what, what's happening in this passage? Herod's plotting, isn't it? I don't think he sees it particularly as setting to, to cause difficulty for Christians. His main goal seems to be making his political life easier. He, he's trying to keep the Romans happy because the Romans gave him this job, but he's trying to, trying to keep the Jews happy because he's ruling over them. Uh, and the Christians, well, they just happen to be the collateral damage. They're, they're an easy target. Both the Romans and the Jews will be happy if a few Christians are killed. But he is, nonetheless, even if he's not doing it as a deliberate, I'm going to get the Christians because I don't like Christians. He is still plotting against Christians. And by doing that, he's pitting himself against God. And that's not something you want to be doing. When Jesus meets Saul on the road to Damascus, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because to persecute the church is to persecute Jesus. And so Herod here is persecuting not just the apostles, he's persecuting Jesus. He's, he's pitting himself against God. And when you, you think about the power that Herod's got, the, the weapons and the, the tactics at his disposal, they're, they're quite significant. He, he can have Christians killed for no real reason. And as far as he can see, with, with no real consequence. He's got the might of the, the state behind him. He commands the soldiers and he owns the prisons. But when you, you compare that to the power that God has, it's nothing. God made the soldiers. God made the earth from which the prisons were built. God made Herod and God appointed Herod to rule over Judea. God is the one who is in charge. 
at all times. So how does God feel about all of Herod's plotting? Well, we're told in Psalm 2. Psalm 2, it asks, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So why are they all raging? Why are they all plotting against God? Psalm 2 tells us as well how God responds. It says, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. See, God's response to Herod's plots is laughter. Because the idea of even the most powerful human king being able to successfully oppose God and and thwart God's plans is, is laughable to God. Just ask Pharaoh in the time of the Exodus. God's in charge, so Herod can plot all he likes. It won't work. It's just like with with the plot against Jesus. In fact, it's said back in Acts chapter 4 that uh, truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So so these groups all gathered together. What were they doing? To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So so did you catch that? When Jesus died on the cross, all of these unlikely allies, Herod, Pontius Pilate, they they joined together to get rid of him once for all, and it was simply all part of God's plan who then raised Jesus from the dead. It was part of God's plan to rescue us, for for Jesus to die in our place so that we can be reconciled to God. This is the Christian message, isn't it? That we're called to respond to. Jesus dying for our sins so that if you turn to him, you can be forgiven and, and welcomed home. But now Herod Agrippa, this is the Herod in Acts 12, he can plot all he likes, but God is still in charge. I don't know what the future holds for the gospel in this country. I don't think our government is particularly anti-Christian. I think that the laws that end up restricting street preaching or evangelism or Christian adoptive parents or Christian schools, that these laws are often not targeted at Christians, but the Christians end up as collateral damage, the easy targets. Now, you you might agree or or disagree with that analysis, but this passage in Acts reminds us, because we've got the same God as the God of Acts 12. Sometimes he, he works in dramatic ways, sometimes less dramatic. But this passage reminds us that however much kings or governments or rulers or MPs or local councillors or anyone else desires to, to restrict the spread of the gospel, they can do nothing except what God's hand and God's plan has predestined to take place. So point number one, God is in charge. So yes, Herod can plot. He won't be successful. Point number two, the the second consequence of the fact that God is in charge is that Peter can sleep. God is in charge, so Peter can sleep. I always used to sleep really well until about six, nine months ago, and now I am often quite unable to sleep. It doesn't take much to keep me awake. Um, And so I am now amazed by verse 6. When Herod was about to bring him out to be killed, remember, about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. So so how is Peter able to sleep? He's been in prison before, yes, and and God rescued him last time, yes, but one of his closest friends was killed days earlier, and Herod plans to kill him in the morning. Last time he was in prison, they were just going to bring him to the court. So how can Peter sleep? He can sleep because he knows that God is in charge. That's the the biggest reason the Bible gives to help us sleep. It's trusting that God is in charge. He's watching over us while we sleep 
Psalm 121, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He doesn't sleep, so, so we can. He watches over us while we sleep, but even more than that. Often, often what stops us from sleeping, it's not the fear of what might happen while we're asleep, it's the fear of what will happen tomorrow when we wake up. That's what keeps us lying awake at night. Yet Peter, who has far more reason than I ever have to be genuinely concerned about what was going to happen in the morning, is fast asleep in the prison cell. So much so, he thinks he's dreaming when he's set free. Peter can sleep not only because God watches over him while he sleeps, but also because God is in charge of what will happen in the morning. His sleep is a picture of how much he trusts God at this moment. Knowing that God is in charge can give us peace about anything and everything that might happen. Whether it is opposition for being a Christian or it is going into hospital for a risky operation, God is in charge of everything. Peter knows that if, if he dies, it is because God has set that moment as the time to bring him home to heaven. And if he lives, it's because God has not set that moment as the time to bring him home to heaven. God, God still has work for him to do. As the apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, also from a prison cell, for me, to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We are safe and secure until our work on earth for the gospel is done. That guy who got baptized last week, the, the ex-convict I mentioned, he's had a lot of operations. He's had four heart attacks in the last four years. It's a miracle he's still alive. But he was, I spoke to him in hospital about a month ago, and he said to me, well, this is win-win. If I live, I'm still here. If I die, I get to be with Jesus. We are safe and secure until our work on earth for the gospel is done. And for, for Peter, it's, it's not yet done. So verse 7, the, the prison break begins. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he, he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and, and follow me. Now there's something really special in those verses. Cast your mind back to the, the days after Jesus' resurrection. John chapter 21, Peter and Jesus have a, a conversation and, and Jesus says something a little bit cryptic, but the narrator explains for us that he's predicting Peter's death. So Jesus says to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And Jesus is predicting there the time that Peter will be crucified. And that eventually happens about 20 years after this passage in Acts 12. But think about that strange detail Jesus gave. You, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Now, now think about what the angel said to Peter in the prison cell. Dress yourself. Put on your sandals. Wrap your cloak around you and, and follow me. I love that. I'm sure Peter was remembering Jesus' words, given he expects to die in the morning. And so God is saying to Peter through this angel, it's not time yet. You can dress yourself. I decide when the time is. Because I'm, I'm in charge, not Herod, not the soldiers. Let's, let's get you out of here. The chains fall off. Verse 7, the, the guards are somehow oblivious, blinded, asleep, who knows? The gate opens for them of its own accord in verse 10, before the days of automatic doors, and, and the angel leads Peter out onto one of the city streets. And only then does he realize what's really happening in verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So he goes to the house of, of Mary in verse 12. This isn't his, Mary, Jesus' mother, or it's not Mary Magdalene. It's a, a different Mary, John Mark's mother. But, but we see then that, that God is in charge. God's in control. And that is both in the, in the big picture, advance of the gospel through Peter, and in the small picture. 
In our church, sometimes we sing a kid's song that goes, he's the God of the big, he's the God of the little, he's the God of the stuff somewhere in the middle. Sorry for not doing the actions. But in the big picture, it's easy to get downcast or disheartened. And I know Christians who can get a bit pessimistic and a bit woe is me about the state of our nation. And, and yes, of course, we can and should grieve about sin, but, but God's in charge. He's not less powerful now than he was then. So as I said before, however much kings or, or governments or, or rulers or MPs or local councillors or anyone else want to restrict the spread of the gospel, they can do nothing except what God's hand and God's plan has predestined to take place. But he's also the God of the, the little, the things that go through your head late at night that keep you awake with worry and perhaps they don't feel so little a lot of the time. What's going to happen to me or to my loved ones? What's about this job or this problem at work? What about this illness? What about my finances? What about something I've done that, that might come into the light? What about anything and, and, and everything? This passage reminds us to trust the God who holds us with his everlasting arms. Peter can sleep in prison because he trusts God. Paul can sing in prison because he trusts God. It doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen. I mean, look at James in verse 2. It doesn't mean nothing bad will ever happen. It does mean that nothing will happen that the loving and good God doesn't permit. Even the worst thing that might happen to us is part of God's good, fatherly, loving plan for our lives. You see, God's in charge, and so Peter can sleep. Thirdly, God is in charge so the church can pray. God is in charge so the church can pray. And here we come to, to what the church has been doing while Peter's been all chained up. We're told, first of all, in verse 5, it's not a big surprise, Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. In verse 12, when he's out, he, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. It's a beautiful picture we get of the, the church's prayer life here in this chapter. We see that they're praying together, aren't they? That the body, the church, coming together to pray. It's not everyone in their own houses shooting up their own arrow prayers, but the church joins together to pray. To pray. So, so prayer isn't a numbers game. It's not about getting enough people to pray enough prayers for enough hours with enough fervency that you get what you want. Sometimes God will just work through the prayer of one individual. Sometimes he will seem not to answer, despite the prayers of thousands. So it, it's not a numbers game, but there is something undeniably powerful about the church gathered to pray. I don't know what night your church prayer meeting is, Wednesday, Thursday, any other day, whether you're talking about regular prayer meetings or spontaneous times of prayer, that the church prayer meeting, I think, should be the most exciting me meeting of the week. You hear far more in Acts about prayer meetings and the exciting stuff that happens than you do about Sunday worship services. Not that we're being asked to choose between them. But that they're praying together and they're praying earnestly. Did you see that in verse 5 as well? I don't think we use that word earnest very much, but it's trying to convey a, this wholehearted, sincere persistence in prayer. But we, we can get a picture of what earnest prayer looks like from another time that earnest prayer is described in the New Testament. So Luke, the, the same one who wrote this book of Acts, Luke wrote in his gospel, chapter 22, Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him and angel from heaven strengthening him and being in agony he prayed more earnestly 
and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I think that's amazing. To use the same adverb to describe the church praying as was used to describe Jesus praying. When Jesus was praying in the garden so earnestly that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground, the church also prays earnestly. Are you praying earnestly for God to work in this community? In Southampton, in in Netley, among your friends and among yourselves? I pray, but so often I don't feel like my prayer is particularly earnest. It's not often enough. May, may God help us to pray earnestly. So, so the church prays together, the church prays earnestly, but the church also prays imperfectly. And that's really encouraging because if we have to be as good at prayer as Jesus, then nothing will ever get done. But here we see they, they don't believe it when Rhoda brings them the news that their prayers have been answered. No, verse 15, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. Trevor was saying to me just uh, before the service, I think his wife's name is, is Rhoda, and I think she gets a bad rap. Out of everyone in that house, she's the only one who actually believes Peter is there. Everyone else responds with unbelief, disbelief. And again, just like we, we had similarities with Jesus' arrest for Peter, now there's echoes of the resurrection. Who's the witness to Peter's deliverance from from death? It's the least respected person in the house. It's Rhoda, the servant girl, one of the women, just like the women at the tomb. She, She runs to the others and tells them what she's seen, just like the women at the tomb. And what's the reaction? Disbelief. Just like after Jesus was raised from the dead. Luke chapter 24, these words seemed to them an idle tale. They did not believe them. So here they're they're praying for Peter's release, but they don't have faith to believe that God will really do it. After all, James wasn't set free. Let's not not get our hopes up too much. I, I know God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. Of course, he's in control, but he's got his plan and he probably won't. We we trust him. It's really easy to get cynical about prayer, isn't it? It's almost a defensive mechanism. It stops you getting too disappointed if your prayers don't get answered the way you hope. I think this passage delivers a a gentle, humorous rebuke to that way of thinking. God answers their prayers despite their wavering faith. He's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, and he does. Sometimes you hear people say, well, if God's sovereign, he's in charge, that's a reason not to pray. He's got it all worked out anyway, hasn't he? But that's never what the Bible tells us. It's the opposite. The Bible tells us we can pray because God is in charge. We're talking to the one who has power to do something. Like I say, it doesn't mean we'll always get the outcome we expect or hope for. I'm sure they had a prayer meeting the night James died as well. Why does one live and one die? Peter and James, they both have brothers who are also part of the 12. Andrew gets to hug his brother again. John does not. So this passage calls us to hold two things together at the same time. On the one hand, we should expect God to answer our prayers in dramatic and wonderful ways, more than we can ask or think. Yet at the same time, like Jesus, we should be able to say, not my will, but yours be done. So we need to live with this mystery of God's providence and sovereign care and and how anything is possible, yet not my will but yours be done. And and we can run too quickly to either of them. I know my tendency is is to run too quickly to, to not my will but yours be done. And I forget to remember God can and does do far more than we can ask or imagine. So, so Natalie, Christian Fellowship, do keep praying. I was encouraged by a recent prayer meeting we had at Send on a Wednesday night. We we arranged for all the women to meet at the church. We did one week the women met, the next week the men met, and we did a kind of a topical evening for both. And on the night all the women met at church, two men came to my house and the three of us 
sat there and prayed for the women as they met. We prayed for God to, to bless them for all sorts of things, for their godliness, for their witness, for their relationships, for their, their work and all things to be more like Christ. But I was so encouraged to think as the three of us prayed in my lounge. Well, the topic was very different from the prayer meeting in Acts 12, but the power was the same. As we prayed, I had no doubt that God was using those prayers to great effect among the women in the church. And then they did the same for us the following week. So whether we're praying for one another or for the preaching on Sundays or for your church's outreach or for nations that need the gospel or for our own nation that seems to be drifting ever faster away from God or for one another as we go into our workplaces for, for gospel conversations or for deliverance from temptation or for strength in the midst of trials or whatever or else, we must keep praying. God is in charge so we can pray. Fourthly, and, and finally this evening, God is in charge, so the word will advance. God is in charge, so the word will advance. You see, we've had God is in charge, so Herod can plot. We've had God's in charge, so Peter can sleep, and so that the church can pray. But here, the word will advance. Verses 20 to 24, they feel slightly disjointed from the rest of the story, but they're very closely linked. Herod meets his end. So we've got this situation where the, the people of Tyre and Sidon arrange for a meeting with Herod, and they're dependent on him for their supply of food. They need to flatter him because he's been angry with them for some reason. But verse 21 gets to the point. It tells us what happens. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. You can't imagine people shouting that to, to Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt and certainly not Theresa May. But actually, we, we find this is one of the times when the, the Bible is verified by the history books. Now, we, we don't need the Bible to be verified, to, to trust it. It stands on its own two feet. But, but when you do read ancient historical records and they confirm the Bible, it does reaffirm your faith. And for this section, there's actually a Jewish historian, not a Christian, called Josephus. And he, he has this account of this very incident. He talks about Herod being dressed in a silver robe that was reflecting the light of the sun as it rose in the morning. And, and Josephus' words, he said, they cried out, hitherto we have reverenced you as a human being, but henceforth we confess you to be of more than mortal nature. Or as Luke puts it, the voice of a God, not a man. And Herod doesn't stop them. He clearly enjoys it. Uh, Josephus tells us, upon this, the king did not rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. And compare that with what happens when Peter's worshipped inappropriately. In Acts 10, Cornelius falls down on his feet, worships him, and Peter says, get up. I'm just a man. Or Paul, when they try and worship him in Acts 14, he, he tears his clothes off. He runs into the crowd and tells them about Jesus. But Herod laps it all up. He receives the glory, he enjoys it, and so he is judged by God. 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. So the historian Josephus, he, he says the same as well, actually. He says, Herod was suddenly seized by violent stomach pains. He had to be carried home, and he, he died a few days later. So this, this theme in the Bible isn't that God alone should get the glory. God's glorious. He alone is, is truly wonderful. And we can see glory in humans the same way we can see the light of the, the moon. It's, it's not the moon's own light. It's the moon just reflecting the sun's light. So our job is to reflect God's glory, tell people how glorious God is, but that's not what Herod's done. He, he's pitted himself against God. He's tried to stop the spread of God's message by killing God's messengers. God has shown him who's in control. And now, when he's worshipped as if he's a God, he laps it all up. God's had enough. And that the message paraphrase puts it like this. That was the last straw. God had had enough of Herod's arrogance and sent an angel to strike him down. Herod had given no credit, God no credit for anything. Down he went, rotten to the core, a maggoty old man, if there ever was one. He died. But notice, as, as Herod dies, 
Look at verse 24. What happens to the word? It's the opposite, isn't it? The word of God increased and multiplied. The word of God increased and multiplied. That comes up again and again in Acts. Chapter 6, verse 7, the word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly. Chapter 19, verse 20, the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So this is the main plot line of Acts. The, The message of Jesus, unchanging, unstoppable, going forth. History is headed in one direction only. It doesn't feel like that, and it may not look like that in certain countries at certain times, but God's word is increasing and multiplying. It is advancing. It continues to to prevail mightily. One minister, John Stott, put it beautifully. He said, at the beginning of the chapter, Herod is on the rampage, arresting and persecuting church leaders. At the end, he himself is struck down and dies. The chapter opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. It closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphing. So here we close, and the message is simple. If if you oppose the word of God, if you oppose God himself, if you reject his message, you will find yourself on, on the wrong side of history. Plenty of people say that about us, don't they, as Christians? What they mean is you're you're holding views that belong in the past. Society's moved on. It's not going back. What this reminds us is that God's in charge. History's going in the direction he wants it to, and it will end where he wants it to. And that is with the word of God increasing and multiplying. So Christians, take heart from this tonight. Be confident in the word, in, in the Bible. Be be assured it's not lost its power. It's not outdated. It does not belong to another time. In any individual country or specific generation, it it might wax or, or wane, but if you look at the global picture, the word of God is as it always has been. It is increasing and multiplying. God's word will increase. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you. You're in charge of everything. As we've seen in this passage, everything looks so bad. But at the end, the word of God is increasing. The word of God is advancing. And we pray that you would give us trust in that same message tonight. Help us to remember that history is in your hands. And help us to be on the right side of you through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, give us trust in you. Help us to sleep well, confident in your goodness and love. Amen. I've chosen as a a closing song to sing about Jesus, also called the Word of God. He's ruling over all, yet he came to, to die for us. So let's stand to sing, you're the Word of God the Father.
So now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.